Hello. It's a beautiful Monday morning. And uh, if you look behind me, this giant weather storm that's moving through South Canada is slated to hit us sometime tomorrow. Uh, temperatures right now are expected to be in the lower 50s uh, with a slight chance of rain. Uh, coming in, you really see a lot of this, this, uh, this storm front moving in from the north and, and we're expecting it to rain cats and dogs. So make sure that you bring your umbrella and possibly a pet carrier. Um, welcome back to Machine Design. Uh, happy Monday of what would be the Monday after your spring break. And isn't. Uh, thank you, COVID. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Um, ha. Bit of cruel humor there. Uh, I did stay true with my promise. And you do not have any homework due this week. Um, because that is a, a tradition that I hold over fall break. Uh, I don't assign homework because you are supposed to have a break. Uh, for those of you who are behind in this class, this is your opportunity to catch up. For those of you who are caught up in this class, this is your opportunity to continue to stay caught up. Uh, and maybe go work on your other classes. Maybe sleep for the first time in a few months. Uh, this has been a hard class. Uh, as promised. I guaranteed that you were going to hurt and suffer in this class. And boy howdy did I bring the suffering. Um, so it, it's been a hard road so far in this course, but uh, we're getting close to the end. We are nearing completion of this class. And, and a lot of what we have left is just design processes, talking about uh, how to select uh, different items. So what we're gonna be discussing today is the difference between gears and pulleys. Wow. I'm going to have to change the name of every video I've ever written. Um, uh, <laughs> Tyler, I don't sleep. You know me by now. Uh, silly man. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I won't sleep this week. Um, it's okay. I'm, I'll sleep when I die, which at this rate might be next week. Um, so we're going to be talking about gears and pulleys. Uh, now, we represent both gears and pulleys as circles, uh, but the thing is that the key point to bring from both gears and pulleys is that they transfer a rotational power input that is a torque T and an omega uh, with theta, the, the delta theta is equal to 360 degrees, meaning that it performs a full rotation of the gear uh, and, or the pulley. Um, they transfer this and, and uh, they, this is usually what the input or, or sometimes the output is. Uh, now with a pulley, um, pulleys work in tension, whereas gears work in compression. And I'm going to explain this a little bit um, by drawing a couple of pictures. Okay. So the idea here is if I have these two markers meshing together, or even better, if I were to use my fingers as an example, um, if my fingers mesh together, in order to get my right hand to rotate my left hand, I actually have to push down on my fingers here with my right hand. 
okay? That's a compression. That's pushing. It's push force, okay? That's the way the gears work. Pulleys don't work like that. In a pulley, what you have is it's the equivalent of having a, I'm gonna use a very rudimentary model here. Um, these are headphones. Um, what you have is you have two belts, or one, it's one continuous belt, but it has two components to it. And as you pull one side or the other, it causes the pulley to spin. Or as the pulley spins, it pulls one side or another. Um, Pulleys and gears are effectively opposites for that reason because you have that big difference between gears push on each other, whereas pulleys pull each other. Uh, now, the one thing that's very interesting about a pulley is uh, that the input to a pulley, uh, pulleys are a little unique. You can have a pulley system that's like this, where you have a belt going between one pulley and another. Like this would be a good model for your uh, uh, connection between your crankshaft and your, um, I don't know, your refrigeration pump on your vehicle. This is oftentimes the the belt that goes out is uh, you have this, this pulley system that, that powers it. And you have a timing belt, you have a number of belts that exist inside of your engine. And really what it is, is it's just two belts that go between pulleys. And if you want to increase the power of uh, the pulley, what you do is you actually have to get bigger pulleys. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so the main idea behind this is that it transfers rotational power. You have some torque or some angular speed coming in, uh, both of them together multiply into power again, and then output power uh, from a gear is that you'll either have a gear that meshes with another gear. So here you have, um, you know, maybe maybe a smaller gear and a larger gear. Okay, and as this one rotates, uh, this one rotates this way. Uh, you may have output as rotational, but you may also have output as translational. Okay, um, and this is true for both pulleys and gears, that the output from these can either be rotation or or a translation. Uh, here, in a rack and pinion system, which is, I've called it pinion instead of pulley, uh, but in a rack and pinion system, what you have is you have effectively, uh, I think the book calls it a gear with an infinite uh, radius, such that there is no curvature to this gear. It is completely flat. And you'll have something that, maybe these are Acme, uh, Acme threads on Acme uh, gear teeth uh, on this pinion, uh, but as this moves forward, uh, it brings the the uh, rack forward and backward. Um, you can have that, or you can have just a traditional gearing. Uh, these are called just spur gears. Uh, they mesh with each other like this. You have some kinds of gears where. Uh, the gear shape, if you look at it from the top, so here's the axle that they spin on. Um, they're shaped like this. These are called bevel gears. Uh, these gears will interact oftentimes at a 90 degree angle to each other. So it allows you to transfer power over a 90 degree joint. Um, there are other kinds of gears that can transfer power, uh, not over a 90 degree joint, but over like 60 degree joints. Um, you have gears where the gear itself rides on the inside of a larger gear. Uh, planetary gear systems, or I don't remember what the book calls it. The book calls it like an inner gear system or something. Um, but this is another type of gear system that does exist. They're not as common. Planetary gears were used a lot more uh, a long time ago because you can get massive gear ratios uh, using a planetary gear. Uh, one full rotation of this 
Well, it would take about maybe 10 to 12 to 14 to 15 rotations of this gear uh, to make this planetary gear move once. Uh, you get really, really huge uh, gear ratios there. Uh, they're, they're not as common anymore. You hardly ever see them in any devices, uh, but those do exist. Uh, old telescopes used to have these because you would it would give you fine tuning capabilities where a slight tweaking on this gear uh, means that you don't move the overall gear very much. Uh, the telescopes that we have here at Doan in the observatory have planetary gears on them like this. Uh, kind of cool. Um, but you can have a bunch of different types of gears, but at the same at the same time, you still have this rotational input, either rotational output or translation output. Uh, the translational output comes from a rack and pinion. Rotational output uh, just comes from normal gearing. Okay. Um, with a pulley, what you have uh, is instead of pushing using teeth, uh, what a pulley has is a, uh, oop, I erased that part. Okay, what a pulley has is, if I were to just simply look at a pulley, a pulley has a belt that pulls on it from two directions. Okay, um, this belt has to maintain tension in both directions in order for this pulley to work. Okay, these belts are tangent to the circle at where they happen. Okay, they always have to be tangent. Otherwise, they're not engaging well. If you've got a circle and you've got this and your belt comes in like here and it wraps around and comes like this, what? If you pull on this belt at all, it's gonna, it's gonna pull back away to a place where it has, uh, where it is tangent again. This, this right here, this configuration can't carry any load. Um, but having tension in the belt uh, ensures that your belt doesn't fly off of your pulley. So you will have tension in two directions. Now that said, uh, if you're trying to transfer power or torque through this pulley and you have the tension occurring in both directions, the larger the tension is, the more counterproductive that is to you. First of all, it's going to increase uh, the axial loading on that axle because you've got, you've got pulling occurring in two different directions. Um, but second of all, uh, you have to overcome more in that torque sense and you have to really beef up your, your design of your items so that you can handle having a massive torque value on both of your pulleys. Uh, what you want is you want a healthy amount of, of torque or of, of force being carried by the belt uh, on the bottom or on the top, depending on which one's carrying the actual torque. And what you'll end up with is one of these, uh, the force will be significantly higher than the other. Okay, and that's how torque is created. The net torque caused by these two forces acting at a tangent on this circle is gonna point in one direction. Okay, either the net torque created by these is wanting to make this circle spin faster or wanting to make this circle spin in the other way. Um, you only have two. So acting at, uh, Acting on the tangents of the circle, if you know the force that's being carried through the belt, uh, you know the torque that's being transmitted to this because it's just the radius times uh, the force being carried through that side of the belt. Okay, so the way that pulleys work, um, pulleys are, are a little a little different than gears in that in some ways they're more flexible, but in some ways they have to be a lot more rigid. We talked about all those different gear configurations. Pulleys really don't have that. Um, let's use the example of a garage door opener, okay? So in a garage door opener, you have a pulley like this, and uh, it's mounted to, so this is, we're looking straight down into the garage floor. Uh, your garage door is right here. Uh, what happens is you have some kind of a gear or something uh, which pulls on a chain 
and that chain is connected to a wire that wraps around and connects to, well, wraps around another gear at the end of this, and then it connects to a sliding mechanism uh, that goes along a bar. Okay, so this slider moves along the bar here, and what this does is this will either let it down by releasing tension in your chain uh, that connects to this slider, or it will go ahead and pull this way, and it will cause the slider to move downward. Um, yeah, so interesting way that uh, that these work anyways. Um, but with this type of a system, uh, what you end up having, I actually think that these might be connected, the slider and the pulley over there, so it just pulls it forward and backward. Um, but what ends up happening is as this moves, the torque that's, that's um, put out by this gear that's pulling up the garage door, uh, you have this chain that comes off of it, and this chain is gonna be in tension. It's, it's basically holding up the garage door. And this is creating a torque on this pulley uh, that is the tension through here multiplied by the radius of this. Uh, so it has to stay uh, pretty strong. But then as this rotates, as it increases torque, uh, to create an angular speed this direction, which basically moves up the garage door, uh, you're carrying an increased load here uh, through your chain. And then what you have is your force here being carried by the chain experiences some displacement. You have a net energy gained by your garage door as the door opens. Okay, and this is a constant torque and a constant uh, omega value especially if you designed your springs right. Um, so this is, this is basically what, a, what a pinion is, but pulley, it's a pulley. This is basically what a pulley is. A pulley uses torque to transmit force through a belt or a chain or something, uh, oftentimes to another pulley, but here this time it's actually to a slider. Um, and for this reason, you can once again have an either a rotational output, which is then your output of this system is another pulley, or you can have a translational output where the translation from this system is actually the sliding along the bar uh, for your garage door. So it is, it is totally possible to have both rotation or translation outputs from both gears and pulleys. But again, the pulley operates in tension and actually pulls on something, whereas the gear operates in compression and actually pushes on another gear physically or on a, on a rack or on a planetary gear system. It is the contact of the teeth that drive it here. Um, so in our discussion of how pulleys work, um, let's step a little bit more into the fine details of gears versus pulleys. So instead of now representing it as just a perfect circle, I'm gonna draw in teeth, okay? And these are really poorly drawn teeth because I am not an art professor. Wow, that's terrible. Um, yeah, none of you ever ask me for art help, please, because yikes. Um, wow. I need to go apologize to my mom between lectures because she raised someone who failed at art. Uh, no matter. The past is behind us. This is a gear. I have to tell you that because this does not look like a gear. This looks like sadness in... You're not worth the whiteboard marker ink that was used to create you. <sighs> so what, what happens here is you have two gears. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and draw the part of another gear here. 
Um, spinning around that axis. And yeah, this is just as poorly drawn as that one. There's a reason why I do not draw gears in class. You know, represent them by circles, because it's nice. Uh, this is not nice. So the way that this transfers power is individually, every time a tooth comes in contact with another tooth, uh, this tooth is going to push on this tooth at this location. Uh, yeah, there is a little bit of grinding. I mean, they, they do slip a little bit relative to each other. Um, but ultimately you have, uh, in order to mitigate that, you, gears usually tend to be very hard materials. Uh, what hardness is, is hardness on a material is the surface condition. So right here, uh, you have a really soft skin. Your skin has a really low hardness value, which is why you can scratch your skin off uh, with your fingernail. Your fingernail has a lot more hardness to it. A nail has even more hardness, which is why you can scratch your fingernail with a nail. Uh, gears have an incredibly high hardness because you don't want the gears even scratching each other. Um, it's, it's, uh, they, they have to specifically temper the steel uh, or whatever material they use to make these gears. Uh, back a long time ago, they used to make gears out of brass. Brass does not have a lot of hardness, and they would just wear the, the teeth out on the gears. It was awful. Um, but no matter. Uh, having, a, having a lot of hardness on your gear teeth means that when they grind against each other, they're not wearing each other down a lot. Uh, so these do tend to be very hard materials. Okay, um, so this tooth transmits power by exerting a force at some distance relative to your, your axis uh, on this other tooth. Now, the distance at which this axe here forms a circle, uh, and that distance, if you were to do your reading assignment, which is due next week, um, Oh man, I want to make sure I'm using the right term. Uh, this is your pitch circle, okay? And your pitch circle represents the radius where you expect your force to be transmitted relative to your gear. So here, the torque is, multi is the force that's being applied by that tooth multiplied by your pitch radius, okay? So as this goes around, your pitch radius of your pitch circle contacts this tooth at that distance, pushes a force, which requires a torque. This occurs at a certain angular velocity, uh, and that's how it transfers power, okay? This receives an input force at a certain velocity, at a certain distance, which also happens to be the pitch diameter of this gear, and, and it just repeats the cycle again. And, a force at a distance is a torque that creates a torque about this gear, and it happens at a certain velocity, which means you end up with an angular velocity. Um, that's how power is transferred between gears. Okay. Um, for pulleys, the way that power is transferred, uh, it actually requires an intermediate step. Gears mesh with each other directly. Pulleys mesh with each other by having either a chain or a belt uh, to work between them. And then what they do, so here's a, a pulley system. Uh, there's a number of different kinds of belts. You have just your plain rubber belts, uh, which what they do is they, they spin and it requires the friction between the belt and the pulley uh, to maintain that to, to be able to provide that force. Uh, you have what's called a timing belt. A timing belt looks like this on the bottom side of it. It has little ridges that go down. Um, oftentimes these are fiber reinforced, uh, really, really strong belts, but they have these ridges. And then if you zoom in on the gear, the way the gear looks, is it actually also has those same ridges, kind of like it's a like it's a gear. Um, it's, I'm not doing this justice, but this is a better gear. I'm drawing a I'm drawing a pulley, and I drew a better gear than I drew last time. 
Dang it. I am never going to make it in art school. I need to stop sculpting stuff in my spare time. Um, so what happens is these pieces fit in here, and it's called a timing gear because what that means is it forces a certain timing difference between these two, uh, and this belt isn't allowed to slip on this surface. Uh, in a normal belt, you just have a smooth pulley, you have a smooth belt on top of it, uh, and if too much force is being applied, it just slips relative to the pulley and it doesn't transport. it. Um, you're limited by your coefficient of friction there. Here, having a timing belt, it actually goes into these slots and it forces that uh, to happen. Uh, now you can, <laughs> you apply too much torque to this uh, and it actually tears these <laughs> off. Uh, that's, that's fun. Um, but, and then once those are torn off, it, it's, it's useless. Um, usually timing belts cannot handle a whole lot of, of, uh, force. Um, again, I'm going to get to that in a second, uh, but you'll have these different kinds of belts. And what this does is this, the engagement between these two, the friction force between these two, uh, causes this to be able to transfer a torque from the pulley to the actual belt. And what that does is that increases the tension between these two contact points on the belt. And you have a constant tension between here and here. And that tension being exerted on this pulley uh, then gets carried along the outside of this pulley and that tension creates a torque in this direction on that pulley. Okay, so torque again, input, torque output, uh, but it requires that intermediate step of creating tension inside of a belt. Here, you have a force being exerted through this belt, and this belt travels a certain velocity. What this, is, what this system ends up doing is you have a pulley that transmits power to the belt. The belt then turns around and transmits power to another pulley. And that's how it works. So, you have the rotational input, which is a torque and an angular velocity, but then you have a translational output, a force and a velocity. This, this belt has a certain speed. And then over here, as it transfers to another pulley, you then have that force and velocity transfer back into a torque and an angular velocity. So it does have a rotational input and output, but it requires a translational connection in the meantime. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Now, with these, you do not have the ability to carry a lot of force through timing belts. Uh, in fact, belts in general, you're limited by this coefficient of friction. They can't handle a whole lot of force. Uh, so this, this does create some issues in that, okay, how do I, how do I carry a, a lot of, a lot of, uh, how do we carry a lot of torque through this? Well, in order to do that, um, you know, if you have a gear system and you take two gears and you just rub them up against each other like this, or they're, they're grinding and you say, wow, oh, you know, there's a lot of transmission force here. Uh, what you can do is you make the gears bigger. It does actually reduce the amount of force between these two. Uh, because of, you have a bigger force over a distance, which is the same amount of torque, uh, you just scale both of these up. But <laughs> that's pretty uncommon. <coughs> Excuse me. With a pulley, um, because you do have a force limitation here, where these belts are rated to only be able to handle a certain amount of force, what you have to do is you actually do have to make your pulleys bigger. Okay? If you need to handle a certain amount of torque, but you're lit rated at a 200 pound uh, force on this belt, but you need to transfer a torque of uh, 3,000 pound inches, you're gonna need a 10 inch pulley here. Because a five inch radius carrying, oh, nope, sorry. You're gonna need a 30 inch radius pulley. Uh, to be able to transfer that kind of torque. If you're limited, only have 200 pounds being carried through your belt. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fun problem, but uh, you have to do that. You have to make sure that the force being transmitted uh, doesn't exceed this. Now, as we talked about in class, power transfer and mechanisms means that if, if you have force times the velocity is equal to your power, you have the same amount of power, but you then limit your force to 200 pounds, uh, you're going to have to greatly improve, increase your velocity. Your belt is going to be spinning really, really fast. And it's going to have to in order to transfer 200 pounds. Making your pulleys larger is going to mean that your belt has to travel faster to complete one revolution. So there's the, there's the takeoff there. If you want to transfer the same amount of power, you have to calculate the force that you need and then figure out the velocity from that. Okay, um, power is, is the guiding principle behind most uh, concepts that we have in this course. So let's talk about gear ratios. Um, we have discussed a little bit in class so far uh, about gear ratios. I think I introduced the concept last uh, in-person class. Uh, but the goal here is if I have a pulley and I'm going to use the example of a pulley. And this diameter of this pulley, uh, we'll call it D1, and we'll say that the diameter is 4 inches. Okay? And this pulley over here, we'll say that this diameter is 10 inches. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and spin pulley number one one full time. Okay? If I spin pulley number one, one full time, then what you have is you have one full circumference of this circle being traveled by the belt. You'll have a belt piece here, and then when it spins around and this, this pulley is back to its original location, this belt piece has gone one full circumference of that pulley. The circumference of this pulley is given by d1 times pi. So every time this pulley rotates one time, the belt moves d1 times pi. That's the distance that moves. That's the conversion uh, between rotation system uh, and a translation system. You have a distance multiplied by uh, the angle. Okay, another way of looking at this is instead of looking at it as circumference, uh, the other way of putting it is pi times 2r, uh, or 2 pi r, because you have 2 pi radians that it's traveling, and it travels r distance. These two are the same equation. Um, but uh, in any case, Every one rotation of this pulley experiences C1 displacement of the belt, okay? Now, C1 displacement of here, these do not have the same circumference. So the end, ultimate end angular displacement here uh, is not going to be 360 degrees. You have 360 degree rotation here, you do not have a 360 rotation here. Uh, instead, your second circumference is given by pi d2. Okay, so how much, what is the percent of, of this that it travels? Well, if we find the percent traveled uh, percent of the rotation of the second gear per one rotation of the first gear, uh, we take C2 divided by, whoop, nope, sorry. We take C1 divided by C2, and we multiply it by 100%, okay? So this ends up equaling D1 times pi over D2 times pi, which the pi's cancel out, and you end up with D1 over D2. Okay, you multiply that by 100%. That's the percent of, of this that has moved relative to this. 
okay? It's the distance difference. So if we go down and, and continue to look at this, um, having a larger gear here means that it takes more revolutions of this pulley to spin this one time. Um, so what you end up with is if D1 is smaller than D2, then pulley one or gear one has to spin more than once to rotate pulley two or gear two one full revolution. Okay? So this has to spin more than once in order to make this spin one full time. Um, and it, go, it does go by this ratio. Okay? And it turns out, if you do the math, the speed of this has the same ratio. Two of omega one over omega two is equal to d two over d one. So if you increase a speed of one, it increases the speed of two. If you increase the ratio of d two over d one, what's going to happen is this one is going to have to spin a whole lot faster to meet this speed, okay? The larger D2 is relative to D1, the larger omega one has to be relative to omega two. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is just based off of power transfer, okay? Your torque exerted on your second pulley is equal to the constant force being carried through that belt multiplied by D2. Your torque carried through gear one is equal to that same constant force being carried through the belt times D1. So the ratio of T1 over T2 is equal to FD1 over FD2, which the Fs cancel out. And once again, you end up with this D1 over D2. Higher torque in one happens when you have a smaller pulley or gear meshing with a larger pulley or gear, okay? And the beauty of this is, is that if we take this equation and combine it with this equation, omega one over omega two is equal to T two over T one. Well, what is the significance of that? Well, this also happens to break down to T1 omega 1 is equal to T2 omega 2, which this is power, this is power. Power input equals power output. Or rearranged, we have this ratio, where the speeds are inversely proportional to the torques. If you increase the speed of one relative to another, you decrease the torque being transmitted to that other member, okay? Here, you're decreasing the speed. This one has to spin a lot faster to make this spin once. So we are decreasing the speed, but while doing so, we're exerting the same force over a larger diameter, we're increasing the torque, okay? So speed decreases, torque increases. Similarly, if we were to start with a larger gear, and power the smaller gear from it, this spins one time, this causes this gear to spin more than one time, we're increasing omega at a result of decreasing the torque. Okay, so this is the fundamental idea behind gear power transfer. We're gonna transfer power, but we're going to either decrease the speed or decrease the torque increase speed or increase torque. 
Um, oftentimes what you'll have with, you know, if I'm going to bring an example of a motor, um, a gasoline motor produces a large amount of force, uh, but it doesn't do so very fast. You may have uh, 60 cycles, you may have two or three piston cycles per second, uh, whereas you may have axle rotations uh, that go up to, to 120 RPM, 300 RPM, uh, 2000 RPM, 5000 RPM. Uh, 5000 RPM is, is a lot of, of rotations there. Um, and what you end up having to do is you have to gear down the torque that's created by the engine and gear up the speed of that axle from your engine. So your engine pistons don't have to move as fast uh, to be able to power the same uh, speed of vehicle. And the different gears as your vehicle goes from first gear to second gear to third gear, uh, it changes this torque to speed ratio so that you can get higher speeds at lower torques. Otherwise, if you stay in first gear all the time, you have to really rev it in order to get a speed because it's geared to, to handle really high torques at really low speeds. So you need to have, it, it just is not very efficient. <laughs> um, okay, uh, and this brings up the ability for us to create what's called a gear train, okay? A gear train uh, allows us to mesh multiple gears all together to get an overall gear ratio uh, that is substantially larger uh, than, than what we're dealing with initially. Okay, so let's say I've got this gear dealing with a larger gear. And the gear ratio, or D2 over D1, which happens to equal our... Uh, T2 over T1, which is equal to omega 1 over omega 2, uh, our gear ratio, uh, let's say, is 1 to 1.5, which means this, uh, the pitch circle on this gear is 1.5 times larger than the pitch circle on this gear, okay? So we'll just say that that is our gear ratio. But what we want for our overall is we want a one to nine gear ratio. Okay, our, we want our system uh, to rotate, you know, maybe it's our, our vehicle axle to rotate nine times for every one rotation of our power source. Okay, well a one to 1.5 ratio isn't gonna pull it. Um, this is putsy. So let's do a one to nine ratio. That's not even. Okay, we're here. This diameter is equal to um, maybe two inches. No, you can't get gears that small. Sorry, this is four inches. And this diameter is equal to uh, 36 inches. Okay, so you have a three foot wide <laughs> gear in order to get a one to nine gear rate this is ridiculous uh not only does this thing weigh a lot imagine having three feet of gear you open up your engine this thing is <laughs> no that's you don't it's like a buzz saw uh, nobody does this uh, typically your gear ratios between mating gears uh, is anywhere between 1.2, well, I guess you can have it at 1, uh, but you may have as much as 2.5, sometimes 3, although 3 is really, really rare because it does require a gigantic gear. Um, your gear ratios between mating gears is pretty small. So in order for us to get a 1 to 9 gear ratio, what we end up having to do is we have uh, this system right here, where our input gear and our output gear is like this. So what we're doing is we're increasing the torque. If this is our input gear and this is our output gear. Um, oh, I got it drawn backwards. Sorry. 
if we're going to a 1 to 1.5 to try to get a 1 to 9 gear ratio. Uh, no, I was doing it right. Sorry. What we're doing is we're increasing the torque uh, in our gear ratio. So here, this is your input. This is your output. Okay. Then if I look at it from a top view, here's your input. Here's your output. Okay, input, output. But what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna connect my output gear to a smaller gear and then have it mesh with a large gear too. Okay, so now what I have is, is this rotates one time, this one doesn't quite rotate one time. These two are linked in the same axle. That means this doesn't quite rotate one time. These gears are the same size, but this one doesn't quite rotate one time because this one doesn't quite rotate one time. The angular velocity here, omega two, is equal to the angular velocity down here, which is still omega two. They're traveling on the same axle, they're linked together, it's two sides of the same marker spinning together. Okay, omega two equals omega two. Then what this does is this now gears with another gear, which this travels at omega three. And this gear is smaller than this gear, so this gear spins slower than this one, increasing the torque, decreasing the speed. So what we have here is omega one is greater than omega two is greater than omega three, okay? And the total gear ratio here is one to 1.5, and here is one to 1.5. Uh, so what you end up with is one to 1.5 times one to 1.5, you end up with a one to 2.25 gear ratio just between here and here. And we can keep going. We can add another axle, put it on another gear. Add another axle, put it on another gear. How many gears would it take at a 1.5 gear ratio to get to nine? Well, you have to pull out your calculator, which I'm doing right now. Um, what you end up with is, 1.5 times 1.5 times 1.5 times 1.5 times 1.5 um, This becomes oop times 1.5 This then becomes 3.375 with three gears, this becomes 5.0625, four gears, this becomes 7.59375, five gears, and it becomes 11.3906 uh, with six gears. So you just have six 1.5 gear ratios in a row, uh, you can get an 11 times gear ratio. You wanna keep going? Okay, and you put seven gears in your train, you get a 17.085 gear ratio, okay? Keep going, 25.629 for eight gears, okay? Keep going, 38. At this point, that means the amount of torque being brought into your system is 38 times smaller than the torque coming out. Uh, this is mechanical advantage. Uh, but this is how gear trains work. If we need a certain torque to come out and we have a certain torque coming in, we can figure out how fast that needs to be on the inside and on the outside, okay? And you can figure out forces, velocities, all that. It's all about power transfer, okay? Um, so in our next video, which, uh, I probably won't be posting right now because I have to go run to a meeting. Um, I will try to post it in about an hour. But in our next video, uh, we'll cover uh, just a simple gear selection problem. Uh, talk about how to do that, how to pick a gear, how to design it, uh, how to make sure that we're getting the right gear. Okay, so uh, I'll see you in uh, about an hour. Well, if you're gonna tune in for a live stream, otherwise, uh, this video will be posted on YouTube eventually, you can watch it later.